Thank God for Jesus today. For his going to the cross, for his dying. Most of all, for his resurrection. We declare today that he lives and we're grateful. Hallelujah. Jesus, keep us near the cross. Bless your name, Jesus. Oh! 
Good morning. It is Pastor Paul L. Anderson here at the Fountain of Raleigh Fellowship, where we believe God's blessings never stop flowing. I am so happy it is in the cross that you and I can find our victory and find the Lord's glory. Today, look with me. The word of God says Joseph could stand it no longer. There were many people in the room and he said to his attendants out all of you. So he was alone with his brothers, and when he told them who he was, then he broke down and wept. May we pray. Father, we thank you for being in the room with us. We ask that your spirit will take control of this service. May all that we say and do bring you glory. So have your way in this place today, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Come on, fountain singers. Bless our hearts one more time with another selection.
Thank you so very much to the Fountain Singers. You're right, I am healed. I don't care what happens, disappointments, I am healed. What an awesome song. Thank you so very much for encouraging our hearts to remind us that we are healed. You know, today God has a word for us. And many times his word comes and it heals us in our relationships. It heals us in our circumstances and our situations, our disappointments, whatever it is. God's word can bring about healing. Look with me today. In the Old Testament passage of Genesis, the 45th chapter, verses 1 through 15. Joseph could stand it no longer. There were many people in the room. And he said to his attendants, out, all of you. So he was alone with his brothers. And when he told them who he was, then he broke down and wept. He wept so loudly, the Egyptians could hear him. And word of it quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph. He said to his brothers, is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer and he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, who you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve my survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and tell him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master over all the land of Egypt. So come down to me immediately. You can live in the region of Goshen where you can be near me and with your children and grandchildren, your flocks, and herds and everything you own. I will take care of you there, for there are still five years of famine ahead of us. Otherwise, you, your household, and all your animals will starve. Then Joseph added, look, you can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that I am really Joseph. So tell my father of my honored position here in Egypt, Describe for him everything you have seen and then bring my father here quickly. Weeping with joy, he embraced Benjamin and Benjamin did the same. Then Joseph kissed each of his brothers and wept over them. And after they began talking freely with him, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. May we pray. Father, we pray that the words of our mouths and the meditations of thy heart will be acceptable in thy sight. Father, we thank you for forgiveness of sins of commission and omission. Now we ask that your word will go forth and accomplish the thing wherein you've sent it, and that it will not return unto you void. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Today I want you to think for me, uh, think with me uh, for the sermon idea. Guess who? It's me. Guess who? It's me. Now we find out that Joseph and his brothers are now meeting up for the first time in years. Remember, Joseph's brothers did not necessarily care for him with the exception of Benjamin. They thought he was a little bit too high on himself. Remember, Joseph was uh, their father's favorite son. Uh, Joseph was the one who was given the coat of many colors. Whenever we read and talk about the story of Joseph, it begins to bring up so many different situations and circumstances in our lives. It helps us to begin to think about what our family dynamics all about. We have to begin to think about how are we in our own personal fi family dynamics. As parents, do we treat our children with equity, equity of love and of property and of other things? As parents, do we love our children with the right amount of concern? Do we give all of them that which is the proportion that is needed for their age and for their life and living? Or do we find ourselves having favorites? We favor one over the other. 
because they like the sports we play or because they have a propensity in our area? Or is it that we find ourselves that we've been the functional, we've been, we have been the beneficiaries of dysfunctional families and we pass on dysfunctionality to all the families that come from there? There are many stories. Uh, there are many different scenarios that can come from this story. This is a story that reminds us that Joseph is, has been out with his brothers when he was younger and his brothers throw him out in a pit. They say that they will put blood on his clothes, on the garment of many colors that his father gave to him and say that an animal has killed him. So now they must go back and tell their father that they, in essence, lied. They lied about a few things. They lied about what happened to Joseph. They lied about their part in the story. They lied about how they said an animal had killed him. But the truth of the matter was that they sold him into slavery. And the guilt that they're dealing with right now has to be guilt beyond their imagination. Even though they're now in a position of being able to realize their guilt, announcing Joseph before their very eyes, they have to rethink life and living. My brothers and sisters, whenever we come to read the story, it makes us all rethink life and living. And how God will sometimes use those people who we put at the bottom, he will raise them to the top. People who we've counted out, who we've put out, God has decided that he will do something great in them, with them, and through them. Our story on today is a very great story that talks about the life of a young man. A young man who finds himself having gone through so much in his life, but God still does something with him. Remember, Joseph was sold into slavery. He was placed in an awkward situation. But in the midst of all that he has been through, God is going to use his life to be a testimony of his goodness. God is going to use his life to show about redemption. God is going to use his life to show that families can be reconciled even after differences. A story on today lets us see that now Joseph is sitting in a place of prominence. He's sitting in a place of position. He's sitting in a place that he has a rulership and oversight to all of what their eyes can see and what their eyes cannot see. He has gained great favor in the eyes of Pharaoh. Pharaoh has given Joseph this position because Joseph knew how to interpret his dream. Joseph now emerges to the ranks to be a great leader in his community. He's one who has great business acumen. He understands inventory. He understands rotation of crops. He understands livestock. He understands human resources. He is the one who, what we might say, is the quintessential millionaire. He has it all going on, and he has God at the head of his life. Now, Joseph is in a room. His brothers have come. They stand before him asking for aid and assistance. This lets us see that God will sometimes cause all of us to be in a position that we have a need for ourselves. In the world in which we live, uh, still dealing with this COVID-19 virus and all the other iterations that have come from it, we find ourselves that many of us have been those who have never had needs that we had to go to anyone for help. But now, we find ourselves needing help from others, needing help from others to get masks, needing help from others to get vaccinations, needing help from others to provide assistance when needed, needing help from others because it seems as though we have run out of all of our personal resources. The text finds itself that Joseph's brothers are now about to run out of resources. Their harvest is not what it used to be because of the drought. It's not what it was. The livestock are about to die. So now they're going asking for help from Egypt. I guess you can say Egypt is somewhat of their federal government of their day. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could all get a, a Medicare, a Medicaid expansion? Wouldn't it be awesome if we had benefits that everybody could find themselves being able to tap into because there is a great need? And Joseph finds himself being the administrator of more than he ever would have imagined. God gave him what God could only give him. He gave him position. 
He gave him power and he gave him a heart of love. A text sees uh, that Joseph is now sitting on the throne. We now see his brother standing before him. Joseph recognized his brothers, but his brothers don't recognize him. It is amazing when we have done people wrong and when we have marked them out of our lives, when we have erased them off the board, they can be right in front of us and we would never think that they are there. Joseph's brother had erased, his brothers had erased him from their memory. They thought he was long and gone. They never knew what happened to him. But God has a way of bringing all things back full circle. The text lets us see that Joseph is now in Pharaoh's palace. His brothers are standing before him. Joseph takes them through this long conversation. And finally, he gets to the point where he says, I have had enough of this. He tells everybody who is in the room with him other than those who were his family out all of you. And let's just see how God does in this text. He clears everybody out of the room who doesn't need to be there. He makes this a family affair. Joseph looks at them and he doesn't say, guess who? It's me. But Joseph clearly tells them who he really is. He looks at his brothers. He lets them see, I am Joseph, your brother. His brothers are stunned. They cannot believe it. They're speechless. They can't utter a word from their mouths. Joseph looks at them and he says, come a bit closer. Could you only imagine how they must have been feeling? Joseph says, come closer. They can't help but think within themselves. If I get closer to him, what will happen to me? But as they draw closer and they look at him more intently, and Joseph looks at them and he says, it's me. I am your brother, the one that you put in the pit. Well, you see, Joseph could have rehearsed to them the story of how they treated him. Joseph could have rehearsed to them of how they treated him so bad. You know how we sing about it in songs and how we tell everybody how you treated me so bad. But Joseph doesn't go there. Joseph does something so different. Joseph looks at them and he says them to them, don't be upset because in essence, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. You thought you were getting rid of me, but you placed me in a position where God can use me. This begins to help all of us to understand that when people try to ostracize us, when people try to cast us out, when people try to put us in places, God always has a way of bringing everyone back in the same room that they started out in. Joseph was now alienated. Joseph has spent some time in jail. Joseph has spent some time being a servant. Joseph had been some time being forgotten. Joseph had spent some time where he was out of sight and out of mind. But in the process of time, how God's spirit, God's favor was on Joseph's life. And in the process of time, Joseph now matures in his relationship with God. We can see the maturity of Joseph in his relationship with God because we now see the maturity of Joseph with how he is dealing with his brothers. He lets them know that there is a famine. And if you go back home and stay, you all will die. But he says to them, come to the land of Goshen. It's not too far from me. But he asks them a question. He says, is my father still alive? He doesn't say, is our father alive? He says, is my father still alive? That lets us see there might be a little bit of Joseph still believing in his mind or having some feelings that you never treated me like your brother. So I'm not going to say right now at this moment that I'm your brother. I'm getting there, but not fully ready to say it. I'm asking the question, is my father still alive? And they say, yes, he is. He says, bring him to me. In the text, we begin to see how the famine is there and how Joseph lets them know that I will take care of you. I will preserve your life. I will preserve the life of your families and all of your survivors. I will make sure that you're taken care of because even though you did me wrong, I'm not going to pay you back. You know, as we are in this era and this season of the year, we have to think about forgiveness. It is in just a few weeks away that we will be celebrating that time that we call Ash Wednesday. 
And as we are preparing and as we look at the liturgical calendar, it brings us to the places where you and I have to think about repentance and forgiveness. The Bible tells us and Jesus teaches his disciples in the New Testament, forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me. Joseph is now displaying this even in the Old Testament, how God is allowing him to forgive his brothers or to pardon his brothers. At this moment, they haven't asked for forgiveness for the sin that they've committed. They haven't asked for forgiveness for lying to their father. They haven't asked for forgiveness for throwing Joseph away. But Joseph tells them, now hurry and bring dad back to me. Joseph wants to see his father. I guess you could basically uh, uh, bring in a good old song and call this family reunion. You know, it's nothing like a family reunion when you haven't seen each other for years. And when everybody finally gets together and you can have a family reunion, Joseph is saying that we're about to have a family reunion. We're going to get together and it's going to be not like it was before, but it's all going to be different. You see, now Joseph gets a chance to set the terms for the relationship. Joseph now gets an opportunity to make all things as they could be and as they should be. Joseph says, come on, I'll take care of you. God has sent me to be master over all the land of Egypt. So come on immediately. Joseph does what only a person with God's heart can do. He's able to forgive and he is also able to invite them. Joseph forgives them of what they've done and now he invites them into his life. Oh, what a powerful passage for all of us. Those of us who've had family squabbles, those of us who have had family fights, those of us who've had family disputes that we are not going to see each other any longer. Those who may have used the words of the mess part, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent one from another. I never want to see you again. Joseph has family reunion. This becomes a time when all of us should think about, can we have a family reunion? Can we finally get the family together? Can we get the family together on new terms? Can we get the family together again on new soil? Can we get the family back together again, but in a new way? Joseph gets the family back together again, but in a new way. Uh, there are those that were not there before that did not know him. They're gonna, finally going to get a chance to meet Uncle Joseph. They're finally going to get a chance to realize that they have family that is in charge. Now, all of a sudden, his brothers probably have a new uh, air about themselves. They're probably feeling what they've never felt before, that our brother Joseph, who we didn't think much of, now we think the world of him. You know, it's amazing how God can turn things around. People who don't think much of you until you're in position to help them, then they think the world of you. Joseph is now at a place whereby he tells them, go and get daddy. Come on back. The land of Goshen is the place that you'll be. And he says, when you get there, you'll have everything that you need. And tell daddy what I'm doing now. Look at this. He says, I want you to tell our father everything you've seen. I want you to tell our father how I have been elevated. <coughs> Excuse me. I want you to tell our father of the great things that God has done for me. Now, you know, this becomes a great lesson for all of us, a lesson where all of us can say that I may have come from quote unquote nothing, but now look at what God has done. And all of our lives, we can say, look what God has done with what I gave to him. I brought my circumstance. I brought my situation. I brought where I came from. I brought my fears. I brought my failures. And I brought them to the place of God. And I said, God, remember me. The story of Joseph is a story of a man that seemingly was forgotten by so many people so many times, but he just needed to wait on God. There's a lesson in there for all of us. Many of us need to just take the opportunity to wait on God. Somebody said he will come right on time. You can't hurry him, but he'll be right on time. 
Some of us need God to show up in our situations. We need God to rescue us from our pit. We need God to rescue us from what we feel is slavery. We need God to rescue us from our dilemma. But if we just hold on, God will come just in time. The story is a story that reminds all of us that God will do something miraculous in us, with us and through us. If we only go and wait for his time. When you and I sit down and say, God, have your way. I love the way the songwriter said it. He said, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. And now as God is having his way, he brings about reconciliation to this family. This family comes back together again. The father is overjoyed. He has his children back together. These brothers are overjoyed because for all those years, the guilt of that horror, Benjamin never telling on his brothers, having to hold that all his life, he can now let it go. You know, that's what happens when God gets us together. He allows us to let it all go. Whatever you're holding on to, let it go. Whatever that fear is, let it go. Whatever that sin is that you have held on, let it go. Because God wants to take you to the place where he will supply every last one of your needs. Today, if your need is salvation, God will give it to you. Today, if your need is to be in fellowship, God wants to do it for you. Joseph does something so funny. He says, guess who? It's me. All of us need to listen. And God is saying, guess who? It's me. I'm here to give you everything that you need. You thought you can get it in friends and family and all the other things. But no, you need it from me. And when God does that, we will know that's the hand of God. Today, God is saying to all of us, it's me. I'm here to help you. I'm available. Why don't you come to me? The scripture tells us, come to him, all you who are laboring and heavy laden, and he'll give you rest. Because his work is easy and his burden is light. Today, put your faith, put your trust in almighty God. And I'm a living witness that God will rise us up from out of the ashes. He will raise us up from out of the ashes and he will allow us to get out of the pit and make our way to the palace, the place where God's glory can be revealed in and through our lives. I want to pray for you today. If you desire prayer, email us at prayer at the fountain of Raleigh.org. And today, if you'd like to become a part of this fellowship or you'd like for us to partner with you as you go forth in your faith, you can email us at join at the fountain of Raleigh.org and we'll join you in prayer. We'll join you in fellowship and we'll help you get to the place where God would have you to be. Until the next time, let's pray together. Father, we say thank you for blessing us to be here. We thank you for your word that comes alive and your word that is true. Now keep us forever that we might glorify you in all that we say and do. Now unto him, the great shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. May the Lord bless you in your leisure, your labor, your joys and your sorrows and give you hope for today as well as tomorrow. It's in Jesus name we pray. Amen, amen and amen. Until the next time, there's a place you can go where peaceful waters always flow. And that's at the fountain. In this year of 2022, God has a blessing in store for me and for you. And we'll see you on Monday morning. To sow a seed to the Fountain of Raleigh Fellowship, visit our newly redesigned website, thefountainofraleigh.org, and select Sow a Seed from the homepage. Also, giving has been made easier with the new Fountain of Raleigh app, available now in the Apple App Store and Google Play Store. Download today, select Giving from the main menu, and then follow the directions to complete your giving through Subsplash. Thank you so very much for all of your gifts and donations that you've given to the Fountain of Raleigh Fellowship. We thank you for what you've done in the past, what you're currently doing, and what you will do in the future. Your gifts and donations helps us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only locally, but throughout the world. Thank you again for your gifts, and may God continue to richly bless you. It is here at the Fountain that we believe that we are exceedingly and abundantly blessed, and may you receive those blessings that God has in store for you. Okay.